were gently lowering the gaze and perhaps just checking in to see what's here for you in this moment. The end of a potentially a long day for some people. Beginning of a week, a new week. And in your own time, just bringing your attention to the breath, and the process of breathing. Noticing the breath as it moves in and out of the body. Perhaps bringing attention to some of the sensations associated with breathing. It might be the slight change in temperature as the air enters through the nostrils. Perhaps a slight movement in the shoulders and chest as you breathe in and out. Perhaps noticing the gentle rise and fall of the belly as it moves in tandem with the breath. And in your own time, Bring attention back to the screen. Maybe making any movements that feel right for you in this moment. And I'll hand over to Roisin to kick off. Thank you, Kevin, and thanks, Ronan, for starting us off today. My name is Roisin. I'm uh, on the committee of the Irish Support Agency, and thank you all for joining this session today. Um, today is All Souls Day um, and for that reason we thought it was maybe a good opportunity for us to discuss something that was suggested um, to us as a really important topic that we cover and we agreed that that's something we should definitely um, focus on for one of these sessions and um, I'm really glad to see some new faces here today and we will be recording this and popping it online on YouTube as well if you can't stay for the full thing. So this is the Irish 30 and normally we do a 30 minute session but because there's so much to cover in this topic and we want to allow room for some you know questions from our audience we'll probably call it the Irish 45 tonight and it could be a little bit longer um, but we um, will we'll, you know use the time as much as we can. So tonight we are talking about grief and loss um, and it's really good to talk about these things to um, educate ourselves and to support ourselves and other people but we do recognize that it can be a little bit challenging so for some people it may be something they're experiencing themselves at the moment or it's um, bringing up memories of something that they've experienced in the past. So we really want to create a safe space tonight for that so um, we just ask everyone to go easy on themselves and um, take a break if you need to, um, you know, get, get, a, get a little stretch, get some fresh air. That's totally fine. Um, I have popped some numbers into the chat function as well. So just some numbers there. If, uh, you know, you do get a little bit upset um, due to the content that we discuss, you might want to reach out to one of those services or you can follow up with the Irish Support Agency and we can help you access those services. Um, we obviously are really interested in getting your questions and maybe something that you want to share, but just be aware that this session is being recorded um, and it will go up onto YouTube. It's not a support group as such, um, but um, you know, if you've got experiences that you think other people might benefit from hearing, please do feel free to share those, but just remember that um, that won't be confidential and we can't take back anything that's said um, in the session. So um, I'm really happy to be introducing not one but two guests this evening. 
We have Orla Scheel, who is a practicing counsellor based in Sydney, um, originally from Ireland, and she has a specialization in grief. Um, we also have Aoife Butler. Um, Aoife is a mental health nurse, originally from Wexford, that's been living in Australia for about a year now. Um, and she's really um, generously going to share her experiences of grief um, following the passing of her brother. And she's going to talk about her experiences um, this is the first time that Aoife has talked about this in this way, so we really want to um, thank Aoife for sharing this experience tonight and recognise that it is really tough. Um, so we're all there for you and um, if Aoife needs to take any breaks or anything like that, everyone's um, understanding of that. So I'm going to get started with a few questions for Orla, who's um, our expert on the topic and uh, some of the, the theory and science behind it. So Orla, do you want to start just by telling us a little bit about yourself and what the work that you do? Absolutely. Thank you for having me this evening. And what a gorgeous um, entry, Kevin, to welcome us to this actual topic. Um, it's very moving that you did that to start us off. Um, I'm in Australia. I moved to Australia on and off about 20 years ago, and I've been practicing clinically as a counsellor for over 16 years. I work as a fertility uh, counsellor in a clinic in uh, the city, and I'm also in private practice as a fertility and also grief counsellor. Um, and I guess my own per personal relationship with grief and my professional experience has brought me to, I suppose, be more specific in learning about grief and supporting others in their grief experience. And Rosine, you said expert. I'm certainly not an expert, <laughs> um, but thank you for that. But I see my role as facilitating and supporting people who are an expert in their own lives, but are really challenged and um, pained and need that support. And I see my, myself there at a really vulnerable, painful time in their lives where I can support them to find the strength in themselves to navigate grief. And I think... People often say to me um, when they ask me, what do I do for work? It's a, a definitely a conversation stopper when I mention what I do for work. And I think that is really reflective on how we struggle to talk about grief. And so this is amazing tonight to actually be naming how important it is to talk about grief and to start that conversation, um, which many people are uncomfortable with or um, feel triggered by or just want to avoid because it's just too hard. Um, and the reason I love working in this area is yes, it's painful, it's traumatic. You're meeting people in a very vulnerable place, but you're also meeting people with their stories, with their life that they share with you. And also you see them grow in resilience and strength as they learn to integrate grief into their, their life as best they can. So that's a really amazing part of the work. It sounds like a really challenging but rewarding job. I Absolutely. imagine that um, you definitely need to have the right personality to be able to work in that field, but I can imagine you'd be very confident for, for people on that, that journey. Yeah, and it's a privilege. Um, yeah. Um, so I think we all have an idea about what grief is, but um, from conversations that I've had from you, it's obviously a lot broader than what we might think. So for you, what is grief and, and what are the different types of grief that we might experience? Well, so tonight we've mentioned it already. We're just, this is literally touching this topic. It's a huge topic. We could go for weeks, months um, talking about the specifics of it. So for the purpose of tonight, we're just touching on it. And I guess to summarize grief, it's about losing something that matters to us um, and having something that we're closely attached to and losing that. So be that a loved one and and or it may be something we're attached to such as an example being Irish and emigrating to Australia um, you're losing your home place you're losing your a lot a lot actually you're losing perhaps your culture your your safety your knowing so that's a non-death loss but then you've got losing another a loved one to death is um, and our response to that is grief so that pain that sadness, that um, distraught, um, anger, whatever the feelings that come up and, and the complexity of those feelings, it's because you've lost something that really matters to you. Okay. 
And is there different grieving styles or, um, you know, ways of grieving based on the type of grief? Well, we, when we grieve, it impacts all of our beings. So um, it's from the psychological to the physical, spiritual, um, all um, as, like our capacity to function is really impacted. So grief can make us feel really tired. It can make us feel like we don't want to eat or we overeat. It makes us feel like we don't want to go out and be social or maybe we go out because we want to, we can't cope with the feelings and we need to be out all the time. And um, it can make us feel really sad. Um, it can make us uh, forget things and not remember um, in, in the, particularly in the acute stage of grief in the first three to six months. That can be a really, really challenging part and the first year. So it affects all our being um, on so many levels. And then you've got the stages of grief. And um, I think the kind of stereotypical thinking about grief is there are these five stages and you go through them in a linear process. And we're learning now that that's not true. You don't just go through the stages and you get to the end, which is acceptance. And you think, I'm done, I'm finished, and I don't need to grieve anymore. And I think a lot of people think that someone needs to go through the stages in a straightforward process to actually cope with their grief. But grief isn't like that. Grief is up and down. It's like a roller coaster, and it waves in and out, if you can imagine it that way. So you might go through the stages, but you might go backwards and forwards through them. Um, and acceptance there's this kind of misconception around acceptance too that once you've accepted the loss or that the person isn't coming back or the change in your life that you're okay with it you don't have to be okay with it you don't have to like it but that doesn't mean um you're not accepting it and acceptance is about living the best life you can live with the grief that you're carrying so how people do that is really individual even though grief is a universal experience, we all experience grief. How we do it is individual to how we grew up, who our families are, where we come from, and what the influences on our lives have been. And I think it's a very, it can be a very lonely, lonely experience. Um, and I guess if I can say anything tonight that I want to land for people is that there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's your way. Um, however you're coping and however you're managing um, is, is your way. And I think we need to remove that element of time out of grief too, because it's a lifelong journey. It's not something, you, you know, you're grieving forever, but that grief can look different as you navigate and live with it. But you can't just expect it to have a time frame on it. And I think a lot of people say, oh, you know, she's six months into it now, she should be feeling or that person died a year ago, that's it's surprising they're having such a strong emotional reaction. But we don't know what's going on for that person. We don't know how they're managing it or how they're being supported. So I think we have to be really empathic to people and non-judgmental and, and recognize that how people grieve is, is individual to them. And there are different grieving styles. Um, so, and that can be quite complex in a partner relationship where one person might be really open and wants to talk and share their grief and the other person may look like they're not grieving and that can cause friction in a relationship. It can cause friction in a family if siblings are looking like they're grieving differently. Friends look like they're de dealing with grief differently. People can assume, oh, she's grand or he's fine. They, they're not grieving, but actually they, they may be and they are but they're doing it differently to how perhaps you would or how you imagine you would. So we really have to be careful and kind and empathic about how people are doing it themselves. Yeah. And Orla, you mentioned there that there's lots of, um, you know, factors and, and how we grieve and our cult culture and upbringing would be one of those. From someone that's Irish but working in Australia, do you see major differences in how you that, you know we've got lots of rituals and traditions in Ireland do you see much difference there um, absolutely and I think um you know without sounding strange we Irish people do grief well we do death very well we have our wakes we have our getting together we have our month's minds 
the anniversary masses. We take care of our, our, our grieving people. We rally around. We And particularly in rural Ireland, where I grew up, the town stopped when someone died. You know, there's a real acknowledgement of that. And, and living in a city as I am now and living in Australia, it's very different. Um, and it's very different at the moment, even in Ireland. And we can be here and, and grieving and feel quite sentimental for how we grieve in Ireland. But grieving in Ireland with COVID at the moment is very different to what we may have been used to. And you may have a grief around that, thinking, well, if I was in Ireland, I'd be doing this now and that now. But you actually may not be because the restrictions of COVID have impacted how we're grieving in Ireland and how we're grieving worldwide. Um, but we have beautiful traditions, we have lovely rituals, and I guess um, we can look at this later as well. Uh, it's important to do what's right for you. So if there's something you would have done if you could be in Ireland, what can you do here? How can you honour what's important to you? And storytelling is a key um, is a key part of our culture, the Shana Key, the storytelling, that ritual that we are very good at. Um, and that talking and there may not be the opportunity to do that in Australia and that's why counselling is a very good support and talking to friends and community and doing this tonight because it's about sharing that helps you integrate that loss but also make sense of it, make meaning out of it and not feel as lonely. Mm. It's so true, it's something I never appreciated until I left Ireland and then I would say it's working with the Irish community here and, and involved um, in, in some funerals and stuff. And it, it is so different. Um, and I'd, yeah, I'd love to ask you more a little bit later on about what we can do when we can't be there um, this year, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so Orla, I might just um, ask, uh, move on to Aoife. And then at the okay. end, we're gonna have um, questions. So anybody who's got questions for Orla or Aoife, they can, um, they can ask those. So Aoife, um, you're a mental health nurse um, and you also have your own experience um, of grief. And we just again, um, thank you so much for sharing your um, experiences tonight. So before we start, do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what brought you to Australia? Yeah, so thanks very much for having me as well, Roisin. Um, so obviously I'm Aoife, I'm 26 and um, from Wexford, I'm a qualified mental health nurse. Um, I qualified in 2017. We do a specialized degree in mental health for years. Um, and I came to Australia about just over a year ago. Um, I suppose it was kind of a life, not a lifelong goal or dream, but from the time that my brother came over here in 2013, he, like many other Irish people, left to come for what he said was a year, because that's what we all say to our parents or our grandparents. Oh, sure, we're only going for a year. We'll come back. It'll be fine. Um, and I remember so well to the day when I was saying goodbye to him and, and I was really upset. I was like, I'll never, I won't see you. Because obviously, you know, when you're younger as well, you, you think Australia is so far away. But um yeah, um, he came out in 2013 and um, he spent longer than a year. He was three and a half years out here. And in that time, I suppose, I got to see the life that he was living, the friends that he made, um, the kind of opportunities that Australia offered him. Um, and I always said he left a boy and became a man when he came out here. So I think at that time, it was always a goal for me to, you know, come out and experience what he was experiencing. Um, he also had a lot of friends that were um, Irish nurses and he would always tell me while I was training, you know, you have to come out here, little sister. They have a great time, the nurses. They always talk about how great it is and stuff like that. Um, so it was just a goal from, I suppose, early on in my training that that was kind of the end thing that I was going to do. I qualify and you know, I would eventually get out there to Australia and experience this life that he he so much loved. Um, and I wanted to see him because unfortunately um, he didn't he didn't come home between the time that he was out here. So um, I had different reasons, you know, that I had things to motivate me to get out here. Um, 
and then eventually I did in 2019 September I, I eventually got out here so yeah it was definitely driven from his life um, and um, unfortunately you know he didn't get home and I didn't you know get to see him um, but I used that kind of drive to experience the life that I always wanted to with him um, and that's why I wanted to come to Australia. <laughs> Yeah, well, I can I can imagine how hard um, that move must have been, but um, special in the same time. Um, and Aoife, do you um, want to share with us a little bit about what um, that was like for you whenever your brother Matthew passed away and, and being um, him being in Australia and you being overseas? Yeah, so... <laughs> Um, as we said, it's obviously a brief introduction. I don't think I could possibly minimize it into a small period of time. Um, it's now four years and so much of what Arla was saying um, resonates with me. I can't even describe because um, my experience of grief is is like a roller coaster. I wrote that word down when I was trying to experience it. And also like nearly, I would often say when I speak about it, like being in an ocean and that sometimes you're floating sometimes you feel like you're drowning sometimes you feel like it's okay and and then out of the blue you know this wave will just take you take your breath away literally and I guess um the news of Matthew's passing was just um as anyone would would probably understand or have been there before on because I couldn't comprehend it it was very much a shock um unfortunately you know as I've said online that he um unfortunately took his own life and it was a massive shock to my family and our community and um I was actually in San Diego at the time traveling with my friend so there was a massive time difference in Australia and Ireland and then me being in the States. So um, from, I guess, the time where I've, I found out about um, um, Matthew's passing and then the whole experience in the last four years um, has just been a whirlwind. Um, I was going into my fourth year of nursing so it was my internship year and um, obviously as a mental health nurse it was a sensitive topic as it was so I just didn't think I would probably be able to even go back to college I just couldn't see a life beyond what I was being told that um, you know my my older brother my big brother uh, my only brother was no longer with us and um very hard to comprehend very hard to you know understand it makes you realize I suppose you get this sense of um especially as a young person even or any age you just see life differently um maybe if you took it for granted or or what but you just thought wow like this you know it doesn't just happen from people that you speak to it doesn't just happen on films that like this is happens this is real life and and now there's nothing that you could do about it so I guess for people listening as well um it's an extremely difficult process and it's as Orla said so personal and individual and you know um I experienced I experienced grief so differently to say my other um, family members or they're his friends, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, but I guess it is just very changeable. Um, there has those different stages and, and um, I reiterate that it, it isn't linear. Um, it's been very up and very down um, at the acute stage of it, I suppose. Like many people, I found it difficult to, you know, find my way through how I was coping and stuff. But with a lot of family members and friends and, you know, just people that supported me, I, I think I've got to where I am today. And 
and even the aspect of being here now it's it's different stage as well so it's very very changeable <laughs> you're very brave um and thank you for sharing that story with us Aoife. i know that can't have been easy um but i know that you do quite openly talk about your experiences and you have a blog um, that's how I came across you originally and that life when life gives you lemons blog and and you shared some stuff there um, you know about your experiences and obviously I can imagine it's quite challenging working in the mental health field as well how what motivates you to to do that and to help others what keeps you going um yeah, I was trying to think about this one because um, I suppose I, as a mental health nurse, maybe, or the type of person I am, I like to reflect a lot about um, where I've been and the life experiences that I've ha had and um, even my own journey with grief. And um, I just felt that um, with the different experiences I had prior to, to everything in my life, I kind of came to a crossroads where I was very stuck in how I was feeling and how I was coping. You know, I was in my final year of, of college. I didn't at the time really know how I was going to get through it, if I wanted to get through it, what was it worth? You question everything about your life. Um, and yeah, it was in a very difficult place. Um, Thankfully, because of the people I had around me, they helped me. And I always said it was like being at a crossroads. And sometimes I felt very much like I was going down this path that was just quite dark and quite difficult. And, and just, you know, I didn't know what was going to be at the end of it. But for some reason, I knew that I could also take this other path. And that was my kind of... I've had a frame of mind that this is what was happened and I couldn't change it. And I had this feeling that was unbearable that I didn't know how to cope, but I had to change it into kind of maybe making what this was all about to just somewhat way help others because, you know, especially in our generation and the whole social media thing, it can be quite overwhelming for young people um, it's very easy to paint a, a, you know, a great life on, on social media and everybody thinks everyone's just ace in life and, you know, you're looking at the other person and you think they have it all or whatever it may be, we all compare ourselves. And I just wanted to show, I really wanted to show young people that it's not all what it looks like on social media. I wanted to be honest and kind of say, you know, yeah, I am in my fourth year of college, but this is what I'm dealing with. And, you know, yeah, I am, like Orla said, actually, I, I remember in my fourth year, I went to that stage where I would just go out all the time. And um, I just, you know, wanted to be with my friends and socialize. But really, when I would go out, I'd just end up being upset because I didn't really want to be out, but I was just maybe trying to cover up the pain of what I was going through. So I guess I just wrote it down and um, I realized that life is hard and, you know, we all come across very difficult things at times. It might be when you're younger or, or older or whenever it may be. And, and being a mental health nurse, I had that insight as well to other people's lives. And I just thought, you know, life does give us lemons and, and what do we do with it? So two choices and I didn't want to go down that particular road that I knew wasn't going to probably end in a very good place um, so I just decided to write it all down and hope that maybe someone might take something good from it. It's amazing I'm sure it's really helpful for other people who are going through similar things um, and Aoife what's it been like then moving to Australia now how does that feel? Um, I have like obviously a sense of achievement because it's been something that I've wanted to do for years now um, and I, I, I said I had a journal and I used to write down my personal goals and it was always on the on the list that I would get to Australia. Um, I wrote about how I didn't think that 
it would look this way. Obviously, I thought I would be here with my brother and, um, you know, meeting all his friends that he talked about and being in the places that, you know, he talked about and and seeing him and him seeing me and how we both grew up. But um, it's had its challenges. Um, I definitely feel it's something that I've had to do to help me um, with my journey through grief. Um, I am very happy that I'm here. Um, but like everything, and especially in grief, you know, the first of everything doing it has been very difficult as well. Like, although it looks great on social media and the sun is shining, you know, I, I'll never forget getting on the plane and being on your own coming out here. It's difficult for anyone immigration, but I was living through my brother's life and I was thinking this is what he felt like and this is how he must have been. And when I got here, I met his friends, which some of them I've met already and they're like family to me as well. But, you know, meeting them for the first time and hearing stories and I would get comfort out of it, but it was, it's, it was also difficult to hear and I would be emotional and you know for the first probably couple of months I cried a lot and and um and that's okay but um yeah seeing the church that he actually came to they had a funeral mass for him before he got to come home and um the GAA team that were so good to him you know meeting those and wearing the jersey even if I wasn't playing or whatever it may have been um there's been there's been crazy different ups and downs and but but definitely stepping stones in the journey of grief that has helped me as well thank you so much for sharing that if I'm just seeing comments coming through everyone's um saying hi um generous you are to share your experiences with us um, I'm going to, I have a few more questions, but I'm going to open it up to um, our guests. If you've got any questions for Orla and Aoife, feel free to come off mute and put, um, and just say them, or you can pop them into the um, chat function as well. Um, so one question just while we're um, waiting for that, and that, this is open to um, Aoife or Orla or anybody else that's got experiences of this. Um, if someone we love is going through grief, how can we be there for them? Is there anything that's really helpful and some things that we should avoid? I can ask, talk to that for a minute if you like, and yeah. if, if you want to comment as well. Um, I guess um, the first thing I would say is no platitudes and um, try and avoid um, platitudes people are pretty good at um, and, and it's not in a mean way or um, an unkind way it's just a way of trying to comfort somebody when you're uncomfortable yourself so by just even saying he's in a better place now or um, everyone has their cross to bear or you know you wouldn't be what doesn't kill you will make you stronger all those kinds of things that we say um, just to try and comfort somebody just to reassure them but it, it isn't necessarily comforting. And if you're going to say, at least, please don't say anything. Because that's really minimizing of somebody's grief, at least, is, is not helpful. So I guess what is really helpful is to actually name um, your own discomfort, even to say, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to say to you, um, but I'm thinking of you. Or I wish I knew how to comfort you, but I don't, but I'm here. Um, and just being, not being silent. Silence is really hard to deal with. Being able to say, I feel awkward, I don't know what to say, or I wish I could make this better. But actually saying something is really important and, and being there for people. Another thing is perhaps not to say to people, what, just give me a call and let me know what I can do for you because some people grieving don't know what they need. And they don't know what you can do for them. So it might be you dropping a coffee over or a bag of shopping or a meal at their door without asking them, just being proactive and caring for them um, because they may not know what they need, uh, especially in that acute grief. So just um, I'd, ha I'd have I'd to have agree with that. Um, my husband died six years ago. And I think one of the, the most difficult things I 
felt was when people told me how I was feeling, you know, oh, you're going through this or you're going through that. They didn't ask me how I was feeling because, you know, as you said, um, even they're like every day is different and some days you're fine and some days you're not. And sometimes you're like laughing hysterically or there's just this whole gamut of emotions. And I think, you know, what you say is about just, you know, bringing a coffee around or dropping. I have, you know, people like they just say, I'm taking you out for breakfast, you know, which kind of make me get out of bed in the morning. Um, and I think that was one of the really great things. And I just wanted to just reflect a bit on the Irish thing. Um, I didn't necessarily grow up very traditionally. And my husband was, you know, quite traditional, especially when it came to the whole funeral thing. And I, so I, I kind of felt like I was a bit in the wrong because I didn't want any months minds. I didn't want any, I didn't even want a mask, but I kind of had to have one, you know. Um, and then I felt like I was bad because I didn't want any of that stuff, you know. Um, but I kind of did it because it was expected. And then I had this resentment about it all, you know, that I had to have this public display. Um, so that was a kind of a struggle as well. Um, but I did feel that for a lot of people, maybe here who, who that is a tradition for them. I, I thought that must be quite difficult in this COVID for people who are so used to being able to go through that part of the process that can't. Whereas for me, I did go through the process and I didn't want to, you know? Mm. So I th like everything is, is different. I think the, the other feeling I'd maybe say was I felt completely immobilized, completely immobilized. Like the, I just didn't know what I was supposed to be doing or how I was supposed to be feeling or, you know, what I had no idea what my purpose in life was anymore. And that was something that like bereavement counseling was the absolute best thing for me. And it's great. And, and sometimes we, you know, Irish people were like, sometimes we're, we're great at the rituals, but we're often not great at actually the talking part. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go through and light candles and do stuff and all of that is, is great. But when actually, when all that's over and done with, you're left with your feelings mm -hmm. and often not able to really express them. And that was probably the biggest learning for me through um, counseling was being actually able to talk about it and understand it and feel it and, you know, go with it. And I, I think it's something I would highly recommend, but obviously people have to be ready for it. Yeah. And I would just probably say as well, like maybe it's a cultural thing, but um, sometimes as Irish people want to fix things and we just mm. want, you know, people, it's like black or white and they're just like, oh, but if you do this and if you do that, and it'll be okay. And I know it comes from a very good place mm. and, you know, people don't want you to see that you're sad. So it's like, you know, but don't do that or don't put yourself through that or don't think about that they might say you know especially being here even four years on like it's it's very like this is my first time being in Australia so I'm grieving about this all newly um and as Orla said the time thing I can't er like just I can't irritate it irritate it enough that mm. it's not a time thing like it's for me I could literally I could be in work, like helping people. I could be, you know, having a, a, an absolutely a grand day and, and, you know, be really helpful for other people. And I could just come home and this absolute shadow or, or cloud could just consume me. And at the time, I might mm. not even know exactly, God, what, why am I like this? Or why do I just want to mm. cry for some reason? And then I just think, actually, you know, it's because it's I'm thinking about my brother and I just need to, have that time and just cry or do whatever it is that I need to do um but it, it's not something that you know oh sure come on we'll go and do this and it'll be fine no it won't be fine I need to do this and and mm -hmm. it's that acceptance that you know as you said it's, it's with you forever and you need to do it and it can't just be unfortunately fixed none of us want it to be fixed we know it can't be fixed we know that you know that person's never going to come back um I think being there and nearly saying nothing is just as valuable as as trying to to put in words to, to fix the situation yeah. so. so true and I think it's it is as you said it's the kindness of people trying but it's just actually letting being there with the person not trying to um 
try to make them feel better when it, whenever that's not really going to happen. Yeah. Um, again, any questions? Um, if you want to to raise them, you can come off me. Up. Um, I've just um, I just wanted to go back, Orla, to the the thing we talked about. You know, whenever the rituals have been taken away from us at the moment, and mm. especially with overseas being overseas, what can we do? So there's there's no kind of I I can't fix this either. You know, so there's no magic wand or silver bullet around this, but. I think what's really important is um, we're experiencing a collective grief globally and a collective anxiety and people are stressed and people are managing a lot of, of things. And as immigrants, we're managing that we can't leave Australia and um, we can't um, go back to Ireland. Um, there's, and we're also managing um, that Irish people are in lockdown in Ireland and um, we're coming out of a long winter and going into spring, they're going into winter. So we're all in different places, if that makes sense. And um, we're in different places in our time difference as well. So there's a lot of, if you've, you're grieving for somebody or somebody has recently died in Ireland, that's really challenging to be here um, and to work through that because of the lack of freedom, the lack of um, support perhaps, and those meaningful connections you're used to having. So what's really important when we feel out of control and we feel anxious is to come back to where we're at and try and do what we can. So that might mean, as I said earlier, doing something rich in a ritual that feels right for you here in, in Australia. Um, and that might be also connecting with family in Ireland or friends and being part of the, the ritual that's happening there. And that might be through your phone. It might be through... Um, writing something and giving it to someone in Ireland to, to use as part of um, a funeral ceremony or a memorial. It might be um, using your phone and going for a walk and showing a picture of somewhere beautiful in your neighborhood and commenting about the person that you're remembering. So it's about being actively um, involved as much as you can be from afar, which is really tough, but it's about controlling what you can control at the moment. Um, it's about being creative and, and what Aoife said um, earlier on about her blog and um, you know she's sharing her grief she's telling her story she's in processing her grief and doing that helping others but also helping herself and in the sense making meaning of of her brother's life and her own life managing the grief for him and um, so it might be writing a letter to your family or friends. It might be writing a letter to the person who has died and expressing, getting those feelings out. Um, so just sharing your story with people around you, um, asking, uh, you know, I'd really like to talk about the person. Um, I'd really like to share our connection. Will you listen, please? Um, and being present to that. And I think um, what's really hard is if people feel lonely and can't share. Um, and um, I'm not sure what the lady's name is, but you're right in counselling. That's a space where you can process and share and perhaps feel safe to do so. And sometimes when we don't have our normal coping places, we do need to reach out to professionals um, health professionals for support and clinicians. And, and that's a good thing to do. There's nothing negative about that. And that's a normal Thing to do is to talk through your grief and be supported in it. If you don't have family and friends around you, it's important that you access that support. And any Thanks. specific services that you would recommend? Sorry, if I would love to get your yeah. your thought on that too. But uh, just on any services you would recommend in particular, Orla? Well, I, I absolutely recommend Lifeline, and um, because it's a twenty-four hour crisis support. So if you're feeling really sad and upset in the night. It's a fantastic resource and I recommend most people put that, clients put that number in their phone um, so that there's no question. You ring and talk to somebody when you need to. There's also the Black Dog Institute. There's um, the Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement who have wonderful supports. And your local GP is a really wonderful support. Your trusted GP. We're really lucky in Australia to have a mental health plan um, and um, to have sessions 
covered if you are a permanent resident or a citizen of Australia. Um, and of, obviously the Irish Support Agency to, to reach out and see what support they can provide you. So I guess, yeah, just, and, and doing your own kind of research online, figuring out what suits you, um, what fits for you in your grief. Um, and I say that to clients, you know, I mightn't be the right fit for you and it needs to be the right fit for somebody to work through something that's so painful and vulnerable and personal. Definitely. And um, just before we wrap up, Aoife, can I just ask you, is there any advice you'd give to someone who's, you know, going through what you're going through, um, you know, anything you'd add there? Um, I guess on a personal level is, yeah, well, definitely one allow even though sometimes you want to be on your own and it's okay to be on your own too but um allow the people to kind of look after you um and my sister used to always say and she still says it to me when I have a bad day she says be kind to yourself and it's okay mm. to be kind to yourself um sometimes we we are bad at doing that maybe we feel guilty or selfish that you know we shouldn't we shouldn't do that or for whatever reason but but be kind to yourself um in regards to in that person that you've lost the one thing that's really helped me is um I have a journal and everyone always says and especially if you've been to any kind of counseling or therapy they'll say write your feelings down and some people are like oh I don't want to do that I couldn't be bothered or that doesn't sound great to me at all but my friend handed me a notebook and I never thought I would see the value of it until probably years on now. And I dedicate that to my brother. I write to him. I write when I'm grieving, if there's a situation where I think it might be related to grief and the different things, but it's a little purple journal. And in some ways I actually kind of like resonated to being like him in ways like I, it's my kind of, hold to telling him what's happening and and kind of just putting it all out there how I feel I have pictures of the two of us in it I I get a birthday card every year and I it's all in that journal so um and it's really good because I reflect on that and I kind of remind myself when I'm having those terribly dark days that still happen now sometimes where I just feel like all I want to do is cry um I open up that and I think you know I've been I've actually felt like this before Aoife and you know you'll get through this little period and you know it reminds me and kind of reassures me as well um and I found that really helpful so maybe if people thought that that was a good idea I think it's helped me for sure that sounds like um you know something so helpful to have you know at hand and she said reminding yourself that you've got through it um would be a really nice idea for people that are going through that at the moment um so that brings us we've gone on 7 50 i said 7 45 um as orla said we could talk for hours on this topic we could dedicate days to it so um you know what the space if there's interest we can definitely do another session um, and allow a little bit more time on it um, but before we wrap up, I just want to say a huge thanks to Orla and Aoife for being um, so generous with your time, but also your stories and trusting us with those. Um, I really um, think that this was one of the best sessions we've had with the Irish Thursday, just the conversation and learning so much um, for, you know, whether you've gone through it yourself or you're helping someone on that journey. Um, can't thank you enough. Um, also thank everyone for joining the session tonight um, for Ronan and Kevin for um, moderating it. Um, just a reminder that um, as Aoife said, be kind to yourself, especially after the session today. I have popped some phone numbers into the chat there if you do need those or just reach out to the ISA and we can help connect you with the services. Um, so thank you all so much. And just a reminder that the next session will be on I think it's the 7th, is it, Ronan? The 7th of December, yes. Yeah, 7th of December. And we're going to talk about preparing for Christmas a little bit differently this year um, with the, the COVID restrictions and for some people who maybe normally travel home. Um, so hopefully we can see you there. We will have some other events over Christmas and January. Um, so we finally come up with a name today. Paula has advised me it's called Balia's Balia. Um, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, um, and it's 
for P Irish people in Sydney who can't get home for Christmas and are maybe struggling a little bit, it's a, a chance for them to connect and meet other people and get out of the house. Um, so hopefully we can share the details of that in the next session. Um, is that it, Ronan? That's perfect. I just want to add my thanks to Orla and Aoife. That was an amazing session. Uh, I think everyone was hanging on every word and it was mm. so, such a value. Thank you for both for sharing. Your, both your experiences and uh, personal stories there. Very powerful. Thank you.